Welcome to Downpour.com's interview series. I'm Grover Gardner, and today it's my pleasure to be speaking with legendary New York Times bestselling author Lois McMaster Bujold. Lois is one of the most honored writers in the fields of science fiction and fantasy, winning five Hugo Awards and three Nebula Awards. She has written 24 novels, including her widely popular Miles for Kosigan series, and her works have been adapted for television, featured in magazines, and translated into 21 languages. Lois has also written several short stories, novellas, and nonfiction articles. Blackstone Audio published the audio version of her latest release, Captain Vorpatrel's Alliance, narrated by yours truly, simultaneously with the hardcover on November 6, 2012. Welcome, Lois. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you for inviting me. This is the 14th book in the Miles Vorkosigan series. 14th or 16th, people have to decide whether Ethan of Athos and Falling Free are outliers or part of the main line. What inspired the first book in the series? Oh, gosh. Well, poverty, mainly. <laughs> I had been beached in Marion, Ohio, with two small children and no job. And a friend of mine, Lillian Stewart Carl, with whom I had written back in high school and junior high, had started writing again, and she had made some short story sales. I thought, wait a minute, we used to do this together. Maybe I could do this, too. And I didn't need to hire a babysitter, which I could not afford at the time. So I buckled down and wrote, uh, well, I first wrote a novelette, sort of for practice, which I sent off to Lillian, and it actually contains the seeds of the Vorkosigan universe. And then I started my first novel at the end of 1982, Moved forward for, I wrote three books in three years, and then they eventually all sold to Bain in 1985. At what point did you decide to start some new series? Well, I had uh, always thought science fiction and fantasy were a continuum. You know, I never felt that they were two different things, and all the writers I admired wrote both. I was interested in all phases of that. The first novel that I wrote that was outside of the Vercosigan series was The Spirit Ring which was fantasy set in 15th century Italy. So it was kind of my first essay into fantasy and also my first essay into writing a historical novel. And then I went back to the Borkosigan series, and that was very good through the 1990s. And then in the, uh, about the turn of the millennium, I had some different ideas, and those became the Chalian series. It's been a kind of book-by-book book thing. There's never been a grand overarching plan for anything. Every year I make a different choice with a different decision. But the Vorkosigan series seems so well thought out, and my understanding is that from the first book, there was kind of a big picture there. Is that right? Kind of. I mean, I have been a series reader all my life. I've certainly enjoyed many series, so that's kind of was part of the underlying sense of what a story could be, deeply inculcated in my brain through loving, oh heavens, going back to the Black Stallion series when I was in grade school and many others since, uh, Conan Doyle's Sherlock Holmes stories, the Hornblower stories of C.S. Forrester, and on and on. So series was always a possibility. And when I first started my first novel back in 82, my entire focus was on just getting through that first novel, which was a learn-as-I-went experience. But it was like clear that this was a potential universe. Science fiction, and fantasy for that matter, are... Interesting in that a series is defined by its setting, which makes all of mainstream literature into one giant shared world series, if you want to look at it that way. So I also had the model of Heinlein's works. All these different works were set in the same future history and sort of tied together. It allowed him to do many kinds of ideas, but still have that series coherence and the series power in the marketplace, because people like series. They buy them. Do the fans' reactions to the latest book, does that steer you in any way? To a degree. I always hope that the book will be liked, and generally it is liked by enough people to keep me in business. That's kind of the basic definition of success for a writer, is you're doing well enough that you can keep writing. So that's always been good. Feedback is a funny thing. I think you can get too much of it. In my early book, back in the 80s and early 90s, I had very little feedback. It was totally not the same world as it is now with the Internet, where you are awash in feedback. I have to learn how to ration it, because I think too much is not good for my creative process. But certainly things that fans say either inspire me or make me ornery, whether I'm uh, pulling with it or pushing against it. 
Where did the character of Miles Vorkosigan come from? This is one of the really memorable central characters in the science fiction canon, to my mind anyway. Where did this fascinating little guy come from? Well, he came as other people do. He came from his parents. Back when I was writing Shards of Honor, I had Errol and Corday as the central couple, and I knew even then that they would have a son and heir who was handicapped in some way, but bright and ferociously ambitious. And that was kind of my first image of Miles before he even had a name and before I was even done with Shards of Honor. I had sort of overshot the end of Shards of Honor and actually got all the way up to Miles' first birth uh, and then this sort of rolled it back to find the ending, its current ending, which is when Errol and Cordelia settle down on Barrier and just before Regency starts. And I uh, put those six chapters up in my attic and kind of forgot about them for a number of years. And then I went on and started The Warrior's Apprentice, which is the book where Miles gets most of his start. And my actual first image for that book, I go by images. I, I get pictures in my head and then, you know, the words, get the words to like code them and get them across to the next mind. The first image in my head was actually the death of Bathari, which was like vaguely envisioned of defending Miles on some shuttle port tarmac somewhere as a teenager, and, and Miles having to kind of like overcome this and, uh, and grow beyond. And then the book grew out from there as if from a central kernel, so I kept rolling it back and rolling it back and trying to find the start of the story, and eventually found where it begins now with him failing the entry exams for the uh, military took it forward from there. So it was a very non-linear process, I guess. You know, a lot of science fiction, there's a heavy emphasis on technology and a fascination with technology, and I think that's a lot of the allure for some people. In your books, the emphasis is on character situations, and yet I'm always impressed with the way there's a very solid technological backdrop that seems very consistent and very well thought out. And yet it, it's downplayed. It doesn't take center stage. And yet it's always there and in an amazing amount of detail if you really sit down and go through it. Where do you get the ideas for the technology and what's your background in this kind of thing? My science fiction background goes back to age nine. So I was reading this stuff all through the 60s and forward through the latter half of the 20th century. So there's a lot of that. I've been a science fan forever. I've always been interested in reading science articles, popular science. My own personal background, probably the one of the many majors I went through in college that I had the most exposure to was biology. And then I went on to work as a uh, drug administration technician at a major university hospital in my 20s. And that, I think, is where I got the most sense of how technology meets people in the real world. I had an enormous amount of observation during that period that I didn't know I was making. It was all sort of going into the bag the way it does for writers. So I had built a lot of ideas about how technology works with people by watching. Because really, medical experiences are the closest that most people come to science fiction in their daily lives, you know, the things that people are trying you know, to, to defeat disease and, and get people going again. So that all went in. Otherwise, it's just general cultural background. I pay attention to science as it is ongoing. I think uh, always my... Uh, Greatest interest and emphasis is in biology, genetic engineering, reproductive biology, all of those things, which are not physics, although they rest on them ultimately. Do you consult people about the hardcore technology in the books? Occasionally, yes, or other works. When I was devising the uterine replicator, which I described in detail in the beginning of Ethan of Athos, I took myself back to my old college anatomy textbook and looked up all kinds of things about how embryology really worked. So I worked out how that design would work very much in the kind of detail that other writers spend on their spaceship engines. And I also <laughs> use uh, experts when I need something specific. For example, oddly enough, in a fantasy novel, I wanted to make sure that the injuries that I was giving to my characters would produce the result that I wanted for my plot. So I consulted a neurologist and uh, got useful advice about how to hurt them right. Uh, biology <laughs> people are usually very happy with my science fiction because I don't offend them by doing things that are just not right. Okay, I'm going to ask a tricky question here. As I've gone through the series and issues about reproductive technology have come up, the conflict on Barry Yar, which is with old-style birth versus the introduction of replicators, 
the role of women. Cordelia struggles to be recognized as a person in a male-dominated society and so on. It seems to me that there are a lot of social issues wrapped into the book and into the series, and I'm always impressed with how in many ways they seem to track some of the issues and developments in our own society. Are those conscious choices on your part, or is that just the way things have developed in the world of Miles Vorkosigan? I would say semi-conscious rather than conscious. I'm always looking at the characters first and say, how can I challenge this character in this situation? And I will pick what challenges I throw at them according to the nature of the character. Cordelia gets to face different challenges than Miles faces, for example. Errol faces different challenges, each according to their measure. So it comes out of the characters ultimately. But yeah, it touches on things because I'm writing for an audience that is now early 21st century, and it has to touch them as well. Ethan of Athos deals with homosexuality. And then the Batons, of course, are sexually liberated and very advanced in that respect. Do you ever get pushback on what some people might perceive as very liberal approaches to some of these issues? I get pushback from both sides. There are people that think it's too liberal and people who think it's not liberal enough. Ethan of Athos is an interesting case in point because it was published in 1986, at which point it was sort of bleeding edge, and now the world has passed it by, and young readers are approaching it with a completely different mindset than the readers did back 20 years ago. That's a reader response problem, and it's always shifting and changing uh, (laughs) with every audience and with every book. So this book, Captain Vorpatrel's Alliance, this is set before Cryoburn which was the previous book that came out last year. There's a sense that maybe we might be getting more in this series. Is there a chance of continuation here? I don't know. As I said, I do this one book in one year at a time. I'm always writing the book of my heart and not the book that I planned five years ago. This has been a very good way of avoiding all kinds of series traps. But it does mean that I can't make promises. I do not have another book in the pipeline at this time. I'm working on a novella, which actually is a Miles Universe novella, a short piece. And it's about halfway through, and it keeps stalling, so I'm not making any promises about it. Uh, It should be fun if it gets finished. I really don't know. It's wide open. In terms of writing, who are your influences, not just in science fiction or fantasy, but outside of that? Lots of stuff. Gosh, I've been reading for, you know... 58 years or however old it was since I was six and learned to read. Everything. Everything goes into the bag. Certainly a lot of the series writers, which I mentioned earlier, Conan Doyle and Dorothy Sayers is another. Georgette Hare is another. She does not write series, but she wrote kind of in a a world that was unified the way that science fiction is by its setting. Wrote uh, Regency, invented Regency romances, really. And lots of nonfiction, but I read that by subject rather than author for the most part. And that's kind of a drunkard's walk through everything that comes my way. There's a lot of humor, an uh, element of comedy of manners in the books. Is, does this come from the Regency influence, or where does that stem from? <laughs> I like comedy. Uh, I think uh, one of the first things that attracted me to science fiction way back when I was reading my dad's analog magazines in the 1960s was the occasional humorous story. One of my early favorite science fiction writers was Eric Frank Russell, who had a lot of humor in his stories, and other things as well. He was never limited by humor. So I've had lots of models for that uh, over time. I would always turn to the stories illustrated by Kelly Fries in Analog Magazine first, because they were most likely to be the funny ones. I was attracted to that as an aspect of science fiction early on. Now, that's really only a small aspect of the genre. There aren't that many people who are doing comedy in science fiction, as they say. Dying is easy, comedy is hard, whatever it was. But that was an early attraction. I like that kind of worldview that allows people to laugh. Part of my lack of an agenda, I think, you know. I'm there to, for people's enjoyment, not to promulgate some particular view of mine, which I will, you know, tell you this story and make you believe. Well, Ivan is developed in such an interesting way throughout the series. Might we see a revisitation of his adventures? don't know. It's clear that there was at least one adventure with Byerly in between the civil campaign and when Captain Vorpatrol's alliance opened, because their relationship has shifted there. 
from when we last saw it. Other than that, it just kind of depends on what theme speaks to me in any particular year. I had not actually planned to write the Ivan book, and I kept like saying evasive things when people kept asking, are you ever going to write an Ivan book? And then one day the idea of, oh, this is what should happen, boomed in my head, and I was off and running. But the day before, I would have still been evading and saying, well, no, no, no. It's interesting that you seem to leave yourself little windows. Even as you write one book, there's always a little window for another idea. Prickles are interesting. They have challenges trying to slot them in you know, and have them have the books that follow never refer to them as a problem. You know, if it was a really important event. But there are these little pockets where you can put in stories earlier in the timeline as well as going on later in the timeline. At what I call the working face of the series. Thank you very much. This has been terrific, and we appreciate you joining us today. Again, a joy and a pleasure, and I see that fans are already very excited about it. Thank you. Thank you for joining us for this exclusive interview with Lois McMaster Bujold. You can find Captain Vorpatrel's Alliance and all of the titles in Lois McMaster Bujold's three series at downpour.com.